thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, before we get started, I just want you all to take a moment to reflect upon the complex biochemistry that is keeping you alive right now that enables you to think. Um, and I want you to carry this perspective of how we came from really humble beginnings in a chemical sense. So my name is Veronica Mijewski. I'm a postdoc researcher working with Dr. Chris Butch. And today I'll be talking about how we went from these simple building blocks of chemicals to the complex biopolymers that enable life today. And a useful uh, way to contextualize this, um, this paradigm is to think of the early earth as this chemical alphabet soup. So before life, you had these small molecules that were these letters in the soup that were diffusing around randomly with no organization, and they had a lot of freedom to do so. And it's interesting indeed how we formed biopolymers in the first place. Um, it's kind of unexplainable. So much like a lot of transitions in the origin of life narrative, even though it's not a linear progression, there is this series of complexification taking place. And the one that me and my team are looking at is this transition from these monomers to biopolymers. Because monomers have to sacrifice their freedom and their entropy in order to be restrained in these large, complex, bulky molecules. So we want to know why that is. And one useful um, phenomenon that we can um, leverage to answer this question is the fact that, or rather, okay, I wanted to conceptualize uh, this transition a bit more just so uh, we understand how unlikely this event was. So it's almost as if we took this chemical alphabet soup, threw it on the floor, and the letters somehow rearranged themselves to look like the opening lines of War and Peace. Is that uncanny? But one way that we can start to make sense of this to see what sorts of rules govern this transition is to look at self-assembling behavior. We see a lot of that in the biopolymers that we possess in our biochemistry. So the linear structure of amino acids in a protein are amenable to forming these 3D structures. In DNA, we have the stacking in backbone to stabilize structure. And in sugars, we see some pretty structured lattices. And so with the self-assembling behavior, that lowers these molecules' energetics and makes them more likely to form. So we can bear this in mind as we hone in our research question that investigates this unexplainable transition. And so we have two questions in mind for this project. The first of which is, well, what is this relationship between monomers and their respective polymers? Are there properties of these monomers that might allow us to predict if they can form biopolymers? And looking more specifically, we also want to see how secondary structure might affect, might affect the energetics as well. So secondary structures are these motifs that you find in these um, large polymers and we want to see if that might have aided the transition. And then the second question, we want to see how unique is the self-assembling behavior in the first place? In other words, were we always destined to use DNA and proteins for our biopolymers, or were those just frozen accidents chosen out of thousands of possibilities? Now, unfortunately, we can't go back in time to sample the early Earth for what small molecules might have existed, but we do have computational chemistry. And through molecular generating software, we have a prebiotic chemical inventory of 12 million some small molecules that might have existed on the early Earth. And we also looked at different conditions. So, and these conditions are based on water activity. Depending how much water is present, um, that affects what chemical structures are allowed to exist. And we looked at three levels of water activity um, to guide our search. Now, if we were to screen all 12 million molecules in this database, that would be so computationally expensive. Um, so we really have to narrow down this list to see which molecules have the best potential to form self-assembling structures that could enable life. And one way that we can screen for these molecules is to look at hydrogen bonding capability. So hydrogen bonding, you can think of this as like a chemical glue that holds structures together. For non-chemists in the audience, hydrogen bonding is when you have a hydrogen atom with its partial charge interacting with the negative charge of atoms like oxygen or nitrogen. We see this as a common um, 
molecular interaction in our polymers, uh, especially in the backbones of proteins. They really help to enable self-assembly. And to visualize what the hydrogen bonding capability is of our data set, we formed heat maps um, to look at all of the millions of molecules that were in our inventory. So what you see here um, on the x-axis, we have number of hydrogen bond donors in a given molecule. Uh, on the Y, hydrogen bond acceptors. And the color represents the frequency of molecules within our inventory that have a particular combination of donors and acceptors. So for example, um, this one donor, two acceptors is a pretty common combination that we have at least for an intermediate water activity um, condition. So we constructed these heat maps for all three of our water activity conditions. Uh, so you could see the real values here. But another useful way to visualize this is to convert this in the log scale so that we can see um, more of the nuances in our data sets. So that's what you see here, same data. It's just a little more evident where the differences lie here. And so you might wonder, okay, well, these maps are nice, but how does that help to uh, narrow down this list of small monomer candidates? Well, the, the molecules that are probably the prime candidates for self-assembly are going to be the ones that have this equal number of donors and acceptors. So we're looking at the molecules that lie along this diagonal, at least for now until we perfect our pipeline. Um, so that's one way that we're screening. However, it's not enough to simply look at hydrogen bonding capability. We'll have to look um, at a different parameter. But before discussing what that other parameter is, uh, it's important to note that this is all theoretical chemistry. And it's interesting to look at how the distributions of donors and acceptors varies uh, between the theoretical that we have up here and in real life chemistry. So what you see down below with these two, the E. coli and human metabolome databases, these represent real biochemistry and the distribution of donors and acceptors. And right here, our PubChem database that represents um, abiotic processes that generate chemicals as well. Uh, so what's interesting to note about these, well, first of all, all our conditions have varying distributions of acceptors and donors. And what I'd like to note here is that for real life biochemistry that we see on Earth, there seems to be some constraints in donors and acceptors. Uh, which is suggestive of some selection that life does for the types of molecules that it util utilizes for life. Granted, these are smaller data sets, so we have to run more statistics on these to make further conclusions, but it is something worth noting here. Okay, so hydrogen bonding, that's not enough to determine if a molecule can self-assemble. We also want to make sure that it's actually able to polymerize or to form long chains. Um, so this is our next screening process. We're analyzing different polymerization reactions and checking to see if our molecules can undergo them. And not only that, we also want to see after these polymerization reactions take place, what is the hydrogen bonding capability thereafter? So as an example, we can look at peptide bond formation as opposed to ester bond formation. And these two monomers, they have equal number of acceptors and donors. Both of them have three acceptors and two donors. But after two polymerization reactions, we can see that there begins to be this difference in donor and acceptor uh, characteristics. And if we continued this polymerization process, we would still see ever more differences in these characteristics. And this goes to show that even just small changes in a monomer, like a functional group, can drastically affect the polymer's characteristics and thus most likely its self-assembling potential. So once we have our molecules that can hydrogen bond, that can polymerize and still possess hydrogen bonding capability thereafter, uh, what we intend on doing is measuring the energetics of these monomers and their respective polymers. We want to make sure that the polymers we come up with are actually low in energy and thus making them uh, feasible to form in real life. And what's really nice is that the software that we intend on using can also give us information about conformations. So we can check to see if these polymers can form some interesting structures uh, and give us the energy that's needed in order to do so. Uh, and so to conclude this, uh, the way I like to think about this project is that the emergence of life could well be embedded in the building blocks of life as we know it. But even more exciting, 
it could be embedded in the building blocks of life as we don't know it. So as we gather more information about other worlds in our solar system and beyond, such as chemical composition, well, then we can begin to build chemical inventories, much like we did for the early Earth. And through running this pipeline, we can estimate what is the percent of these monomers in these worlds that could form self-assembling structures and thus might be a basis for life. Uh, and I find that very exciting for our future. Um, so thank you so much to Dr. Chris Butch and to Dr. Eric Smith for their guidance and uh, their support on this project. At this point, I'd be happy to take any questions. Great job, Veronica. Really good. Thanks. <laughs> Amazing presentation. Congratulations. The floor is open for Veronica. If nobody has a question, I do. <laughs> so, okay, great. <laughs> so your presentation made me think a lot about my own discipline, which is geology, where you take like rocks and, and, and minerals in their uh, landscape environment have a story to tell. Yeah. You can untangle the story of the rocks. You have a whole history that un unveils itself before your eyes, and it's amazing. And I feel like you're doing the same thing with the building blocks of life, with the yeah. polymers, with the hydrogen bonds. Can you unveil a bigger story there? So it's this right. beautiful detective work. Um, have you thought about what potential setting, or perhaps what is your favorite setting in which this chemistry can happen in? And where, in, based on your experience now, do you think your origin of life could have happened? Ooh, in terms of the early Earth? Yeah. Oof, what a question. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I have a favorite setting. Um, something that really intimidates me about the origin of life question is just the sheer fact that we can't go back in time. Um, what it, what I do think, though, is that wherever the origin of life took place, if it was a singular event, I would assume that it would have to have the right amount of diversity in its monomers. So this is based on my conversations with Chris and Eric. Um, they've really helped me think about this. But if you have too little um, diversity, then probably nothing's going to happen. But then if you have too much diversity in um, these small molecules, then you also won't result in any sort of um, sensical structures. Um, I think the entropy would be far too strong in that scenario. Um, so I, I, this might be a cop-out answer, but I imagine that this environment will be quite balanced in what its ch chemical makeup is. Well, not too much, but not too little. Well, not all I cop out because nobody can answer that, right? That's okay. <laughs> based on your experience. It could also be that one setting created some aspects of the molecular engine when all that was transported to another setting, which allowed other chemistry to happen. Right. So maybe, maybe you need the whole Earth as a chemical system to transfer chemistry around to generate the building blocks of life. I don't know. But yeah. just, for, just as a thought to uh, take your science into the imaginative world, which is yeah. my no, favorite it's, part of astrobiology. It's cool to think about the Earth as a, a sort of an assembly line in that, in that sense. I'll send you a paper. OK. <laughs> I'm excited. Uh, wonderful. Um, so I have a few minutes if there. I, I got a. I got a. I got one question. Uh, just okay. Just to ask. Um, I don't know if, if it um, falls to your your expertise, but um, I think um, the way you're screening it based on hydrogen, I think that is um, working pretty well for I think um, polymerization of amino acids and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. How do you see um, um, polymerizing of, uh, of scrap? I mean, how do you get polysaccharides? Do you have any uh, idea, any insight? Uh, let me just repeat your question back so I understand it correctly. So um, I talked about amino acid polymerization, but your question is in regards to polysaccharides or other types yeah. of biopolymers? Yeah. Awesome. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so that's actually my current work. I'm looking at different polymerization reactions. Um, and much of that I'm deriving from literature in biology and biochemistry. So with polysaccharides in particular, um, those are linked by glycosidic bonds. Um, 
which I learned can vary quite a bit. So um, here, I'll just go back to this example. So you can see that with peptide bonds, um, they're linked because there's an amino group here and a carboxylic acid group here. Um, with carbohydrates, my understanding is that you would need uh, an alcohol group at the very least. And what that linkage is going to look like, um, it's going to be linked by an oxygen atom, but ignore this carbonyl group. Um, so I guess a more succinct answer to your question is I can look at different biochemical reactions, notice which functional groups are present to enable those reactions, observe what the linkage is, and then generate rule sets for uh, my code from there. Does that answer your question? Sure. Veronica, you have a question from Sukrit. Thank you so much. You sound yeah. really passionate. Sukrit, you have a question for, for Veronica? Thank you. Um, Veronica, this is a little bit anterior to the main thrust of your talk, but you're the, um, I don't, this is, you're talking about something that I don't really understand or I'm looking for an update on. What is yeah. the latest thinking on how to solve the bond hydrolysis problem in terms of making uh, multimers? Um, I am actually not familiar with that problem. Or like, it's just like sticking the monomers together, the fact that water attacks the bond, like how do you get around that problem? Or like, what are, what are your thoughts as to how to solve that problem right now with what you've described? Oh, oh, in terms of hydrolysis, how right. biopolymers are, yeah, that's interesting. So for those of you who aren't familiar, um, our proteins and DNA are quite susceptible to water just totally annihilating those molecules. But fortunately with self-assembly, um, there are bonds uh, such as hydrogen bonds that are able to maintain that structure. Okay. Um, and in, in terms of the hydrolysis problem, I think, um, I think we're, we're looking first at small molecules that are just able to self-assemble in the first place. And then I think context will um, play a bigger role from there. Um, and then this is somewhat related to your question, but in terms of these different uh, conditions, so for example, low water activity um, versus high water activity, well, with high water activity, hydrolysis does occur. And so that prohibits um, certain bonds from forming in our small molecule database, whereas with low water, um, you know, hydrolysis isn't even a problem. Um, but in terms of like, you know, how polymers are able to sustain themselves in a given environment, uh, we aren't quite there yet. Okay, thanks. Thanks for your question. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.